Let's come before the Lord in prayer and ask for a blessing over the reading of His Word and over this service. Let's, let's pray. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, Father of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we thank You. We thank You for all Your love and for Your grace and for Your mercy. And we praise You for it all. We give glory to You. And we thank You that we can be here together as, as Your people this morning here at Ebenezer to, to praise You, but also to meet with You and to hear You speak through Your Word and through Your servant. And we pray, Lord, that You would bless this time, that You would be pleased to use this entire worship service as an instrument in Your hands to form us, to form and fashion us in an encounter with You as we receive Your greeting, as we hear Your law, as we're convicted of sin, as we're pointed to our need for a Savior, to Jesus Christ. And as we're comforted in the gospel of Jesus Christ, of the forgiveness of sins, of new life, of life eternal, the hope that we have in this life and in the life to come. And we pray that you would also be pleased to use the preaching of the gospel. May you use it to form faith as an instrument, a means of grace. May you use it to form faith, to strengthen faith, but also may you use it to encourage and to equip. And it's our prayer, Father, that we would go from here not only encouraged in the gospel of Jesus Christ, but encouraged to participate in your mission in the world. And so, Father, bless this time. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. So the text for the sermon this morning is from 1 Timothy 4. We've been doing a series, for those of you who maybe, maybe guessed, we've been doing a series working through this letter of the Apostle Paul to a young protege, a, lo- a young pastor named Timothy. And we've been working our way through the letter. We've now come to, to chapter 4. And so what I'd like to do is read the whole chapter. And we're going to focus specifically on verses 6 through 10 right in the middle of the passage. So let's read. If you've got a Bible, I encourage you to turn with me to it and then be able to keep that with you as we go through, the, through those verses. But 1 Timothy 4, beginning at verse 1. This is God's Word. Now the Spirit expressly says that in later times, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared, who forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is made holy by the word of God and prayer." Here's the verses we're going to focus on. If you put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, being trained in the words of faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed. Have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. For to this end we toil and strive because we have our hope set on the living God who is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe. And then we'll continue reading. Command and teach these things. Let no one despise you for your youth. But set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, to to teaching. Do not neglect the gift you have, which was given you by prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. Practice these things, immerse yourself in them, so that all may see your progress." 
Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by doing so, you will save both yourself and your hearers. This is God's Word. Brothers and sisters in our Lord Jesus Christ, this, uh, this text as you may have figured out, is specifically directed at a pastor, a young pastor named Timothy. So, in a sense, you could say, well, this is, a, this is a sermon for pastors, not much for us. But in addressing the pastor, our Savior addresses all of us. What is good for the preacher when it comes to being a good servant of the Lord speaks to all of us about what is good for us in this life as we have put our hope and trust in Jesus as our Savior and as we follow Jesus as our Lord and King, as good servants. So it's a sermon that it speaks to all of us. And you see it as, as Paul addresses Timothy. He, he's a pastor, but he's, he's, he's addressed as one who is, is taught and being taught, and who teaches. He's trained and being trained, and he's also training others for godliness. He's toiling and striving for mission of God in the world, and he's also equipping others to participate in that mission. And so, what we're going to do this morning is we're going to look at the task that was given to the good servant of Christ Jesus and what it looks like to live out that task. It's about instruction, it's about training, it's about mission. It's given to the pastor, but also to us, and it's vitally important for all of us as church. So he begins then with gospel instruction. If you've got your Bibles with you, you can see there in chapter 4, Verse 6, he says, you know, if you put these things before the brothers, and you can say the brothers and the sisters, before the congregation. Now, that word that's translated as put before in our English Bibles is, is actually a word that means something like teaching. It's instruction. So, the things that, that Paul has spoken of in the first five verses of this chapter, you know, what the Spirit has clearly taught, the, the clear testimony of the Spirit that people will depart from the faith... You know, that, that somehow they'll, they'll devote themselves to, you know, to, to other stories to, by deceitful spirits, the teachings of demons. They'll be hypocritical or insincere liars who will come in and draw people away from the gospel. He's saying the Spirit has clearly said this, and you need to teach the people that this is coming, that it's going to touch them, that it's going to draw some of them away. So this pastor, the pastor's role here, Timothy's role is to warn. People's faith will be shipwrecked by this. And the good servant of Christ Jesus will put this before the brothers and sisters. Out of a love for Jesus Christ and a love for the household of God, the family of God, brothers and sisters, Timothy, as well as the elders and the deacons, and then to the brothers. This is this picture of loving in the church. It's a beautiful chain. You see it? Timothy is to love his brothers and sisters in Christ by teaching them. But it begins with Paul telling Timothy to do that. It begins with the Spirit clearly saying what's going to happen. And it starts with Christ. You have this beautiful chain of love from Christ through His Spirit to Paul to Timothy to the church. A picture of love through teaching and pastoral care. And it's a picture that we all get to be part of. This, Both in terms of, of Jesus' love for us in receiving teaching and pastoral care, which comes from Christ ultimately, but also in doing this for others. You get to participate in the love of God the love of Jesus for His church, when you receive instruction and when you give it. 
And then this act of teaching, Paul says, will not be without effect on the one who teaches. It's fascinating when you look at what Paul says to Timothy next. You know, being trained. You would be a good servant of Christ Jesus, being trained, and, and the, the word could be translated actually as, as being brought up or nourished in the words of, faith, of the faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed. So, the sense that, that Paul is using here is that this act of, of, of being brought up, being nourished in the Word is something that's constantly or continually happening. It's not something that happened in the past, you know, now that you've been fed, you know, now go work. No, continually being, that doing this act of teaching, well, being fed is actually part of you being fed. You know, Timothy already knows the gospel of Jesus Christ. In fact, he knew it for a long time. You know, he's a young man, but his grandmother Lois and his, his, his mother Eunice, you know, we, we know this from 2 Timothy 1.5, they were believers. We're not sure when they became believers, but Timothy's father was a Greek. From 2 Timothy 3.15, we know that Timothy had been taught the Scriptures from infancy. Now, that could have meant that his, his mother was in some way teaching him about Jesus, even though he wasn't, you know, actually a circumcised Jew. We, we know that from other parts, from Acts 16, that there's, there's a weird thing going on with Timothy in terms of the relationship to Judaism, but you have this sense that Timothy from his youth would have been raised to know Jesus. Kind of like us. You know, a lot of times we feel like we're missing out, we don't have a conversion story or a testimony because we just saw Jesus was just always there. But you've got Paul writing to somebody for whom Jesus was probably just always there. He knew Jesus, he knew the story of the gospel. And what Paul says to him is in the face of all of these false narratives, these false stories, these silly, you know, irreverent myths that are just spread in just silly ways, you know, the corrective to that is to go back to what you always have been taught about Jesus. The good news of Jesus Christ. The same place that we're all to go, to God's Word to the good doctrine of Scripture, to hear Him speak. And what we can say is, as we look at what Paul says here about teaching, about instruction, gospel instruction, you can really take away four things here. You know, on the, you know, teaching is loving, teaching is learning, teaching is true, teaching is authentic. Like, it's, it's an act of love. It's within the family for the brothers and sisters. The fact that Jesus saved me that He saved one like me means that I will teach you about Him and warn you and I will confront sin and deception with the truth and that when parents and friends teach others, they do the same. Paul says in 1 Timothy 1, 15-17, you know, the saying is trustworthy, worthy of full acceptance, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. And I love you and I want you to know the gospel. But teaching is learning that the act of sharing the gospel and teaching the truths of the scripture is part of how faith grows and flourishes as part of our continually growing in Christ. And for teaching to be real teaching, it needs to be true. You know, Paul contrasts throughout this, this letter to Timothy these false words, false teacher, you know, these words, the words of faith and the good doctrine is contrasted with silly and irreverent or profane myths, these contrived stories. And Paul says the gospel is not a contrived story. The gospel is the gospel because it is true. 
And you need to know the true story. That's why it must be taught. And then teaching is authentic. That means the teacher believes the message that he preaches. That the one who teaches, be that as a parent or as a friend, also is talking about a place they have been. Not a place they have only heard about, but a place they've been. They know the truth. They know Jesus. They know the good news of forgiveness of sins and new life in Jesus. And as they teach it, it's reflected in the way they live. It's something that you see throughout Paul's letters, that pastors and elders and leaders, that they, and, and Paul himself, is to set an example in the way they live. That there is something about the way, the way they live that, that shows that they truly believe and live the message, that they are an example in how they live. It sounds like this daunting message, but the point is not, oh, you've got to be so good and so perfect and so wonderful that people go, oh, I'm drawn to this person. No, the point is that when people see you, they see authenticity. They see that you truly believe the thing you say, that you live the hope you have. Paul's talking to Timothy about gospel instruction, being a good servant of Christ Jesus by teaching. And there is this sense that we can say that a faith not shared, and this is where it touches all of us, that a faith not shared and taught will be a faith that atrophies. Think about that. That if you believe in Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, that He saved you from sin, that He is your hope, hope in this life and in the life to come. And it doesn't mean anything for anybody else. It's just kind of a little thing you've figured out or is good for you, a little treasure you're going to keep for yourself. The fact of the matter is your faith atrophies. That means, like I... I get hurt a lot playing sports. I've had knee surgery on both my knees, and so when you, ha- you can't use your legs, just for, even just for a month, they atrophy. The legs just shrivel up. They, 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 they go to half the size. And that happens with your faith. If it's not shared, if it's not taught, if it's just something for you, and nobody else ever knows about it from you, never sees it in you, it atrophies. It dies. That faith separated from love is just a noisy gong. That a teacher who was not learning and growing is dying. That a teacher who is not seeing the gospel as the truth on which the world stands, that he's falling. And that a teacher that doesn't really know Jesus is blind and lost. But a teacher who loves, a teacher who continually learns, who knows and loves the truth, who lives the truth, there is a good servant of Christ Jesus who flourishes as an instrument of flourishing in the house of God. And that's what every pastor wants to be, longs to be in all his weaknesses. And that's the pastor that you want, and that's what you want for your pastor. You know, Paul says to his readers, pray for me also. And I say to you, pray for me also. And this is also what you want to see in yourself and those around you. You want to, you just want to see this beautiful flourishing happening. It's what Christ longs to see. And the church is the place where He does this work. In the fellowship, in the worship services, in homes, families, friendships. This is the picture of discipleship. Such an important thing for the Christian life. Discipleship. There is this sense in which the pastor teaches from the pulpit. But there is also a sense, and you'll see this, Paul's going to get into this later on in chapter 5, where other members mentor, where other members 
walk alongside teaching and being taught. This is part of the Christian life. And it's not just for others, but it's for you. That the act of walking along somebody else and teaching them the truth that you already know means that you will dive deeper into that truth and deeper into an understanding of what it means for you. It's a picture of discipleship within the house of God. It starts with Christ, the Good Shepherd. It continues with the pastoral ministry of the preacher, the teacher, the, the, the elders, the deacons, but also with equipping the saints for works of service. Ephesians 4, verses 12 and 13, that the role of the pastor is not just to be the only one teaching, but that it is about equipping all of you for works of service, that you would participate in the work of Christ in His church. It's a picture you get to be part of. And then Paul then says, rather train yourself for godliness. And that's the next thing we're going to see here in this passage. When he's talking about being a good servant of Christ Jesus, of the pastor, all of us, What that picture involves is training for godliness. And the word training that we have here is actually, the Greek word, the Greek verb used is is actually connected to the word we have for gymnasium. And so the picture here is a physical exercise of self-discipline, of training. And the goal of this training, Paul's saying, is godliness. And so what is godliness? Godliness is, is our response to God's love. It's a life lived in step with the Holy Spirit. It's a life lived in love for God and for our neighbor. Godliness is living according to God's Word, according to His will and everything. We just read the Ten Commandments. You know, godliness is shown there. This is what love for God looks like. This is what love for your neighbor looks like. And godliness is a life lived caught up in living that, being that. To quote Paul's words earlier in, the, in his letter to Timothy, 1 Timothy 1, he's, you know, 5 to 7, he's, he's, he's talking to Timothy about what he's charging him to do. He says, the aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. That's just a beautiful picture. That, as, as Paul himself says a few verses later, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. Knowing that Jesus came into the world, we respond to to save sinners, we respond with love and grace and with a desire to honor and serve Him as good servants. That we can grow in the way we live for Jesus. Now this idea of, of living, or this idea, sorry, of training for godliness, that somehow we can improve our response to God, that we can do something about it, it has not always been appreciated in the Reformed or the Presbyterian tradition for a number of reasons. Number one, it sounds a lot like legalism. It sounds a lot like you need to work really, really hard You know, train yourself for godliness, do all these things, and then somehow God will say, you're worthy of being saved, you're worthy of my love. It also sounds a lot like work and requirements in order to be a Christian. It's something about, you know, you got to be something that you might not be. You know, that's just not me. You know, I... I'm not really comfortable, you know, reading. I'm not a good reader. I don't like reading. That's the big one. I don't like reading. I fall asleep. But then you've confronted with the fact that there's this, the Word. You you know, I, I have a hard time praying. You're trying to make me be something I'm not. In fact, it sounds, well, it sounds like a gifted gym membership, doesn't it? You ever gotten one of those? I haven't, not yet. 
It's like you get this membership to be healthy at a gym and you're actually not really that interested. I had an uncle who got one. My brother saw him at the gym and said, I didn't know you worked out. He says, yeah, my wife gave me a gym membership. I'm almost done. So it's like works, this idea of training for godliness can seem like this undesirable task and perhaps even with a bit of a theological challenge to it. But what if you turned it around and you saw godliness instead as enjoying God and flourishing in His love and in the new life you have in Jesus. You know, godliness is not something that you do to earn God's love. That earns you the reward of salvation. The reward of salvation. The gift of faith. All of that is a gift of grace from God. And to quote someone else, and godliness itself a fruit of the Spirit of God's grace results in the increasing possession and enjoyment of the reward. Let me say that again. Godliness itself, a fruit of the Spirit, by God's grace, results in the increasing possession and enjoyment of this reward. You have been saved. And by His grace, God, through His Spirit, gives you the gift of godliness. He plants it there. And it's through that godliness that you increase your hold on the promise of salvation, of God's love. You live in it, and you enjoy it. It doesn't earn it. It's part of enjoying it. You know, the Westminster Shorter Catechism, what is the chief end of man? To glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. In fact, the well-known pastor John Piper, sort of his, his ministry desiring God, is kind of built around adapting this, this, this answer, is that we are to glorify God by enjoying Him. That's a beautiful picture of godliness. What Paul's saying is that there's a way for you to grow in your enjoyment of God by training for godliness. It's true for the pastor. It's true for all of us. In fact, Peter, 2 Peter 1, 5 to 8, is talking about the faith, the promise of the gospel. And he's, talking, he's, he's talking to his readers. He says, supplement your faith with virtue, your virtue with knowledge. And then he goes on, self-control, steadfastness, godliness, brotherly affection, love. And then he says, for if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they will keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's this beautiful call to you to practice, to exercise with the goal of godliness. And the canons of Dort, which seems like such a dry theological confession for us, talking about the doctrine of election. Chapter 5, Article 2, when it's dealing with daily sins of weaknesses, you know, says, you know, therefore daily sins of weaknesses spring up and defects cling even to the best work of the saints. These are for them a constant reason to humble themselves before God, to flee to the crucified Christ, to put the flesh to death more and more through the spirit of prayer and by holy exercises of godliness and to long and strive for the goal of perfection until at last, delivered from this body of death, they reign with the Lamb of God in heaven. Exercises of godliness. It was written 400 years ago, but the point is that there are things that you can do that God has given to you. And Timothy as a pastor, we as members of the church, were given these and he's saying that there is this value in godliness that holds promise for life now and in the life to come. You know, physical training, he says, that has some value. There's benefit to physical training, to physical exercise. But how much more 
spiritual exercise and exercises of God and training for godliness. You know, it holds the promise of eternal life and blessedness with God, both now experienced in the present, in this life, but also in the life to come. There is this sense in which godliness in this life prepares us for eternity. That what we enjoy here and what we learn to know and enjoy more and more through spiritual training is what we will be doing in the new heaven and the new earth. That you're being equipped for eternity. The things you love here that you would long to see flourish even more in your life. The hope of the gospel is that in the new heaven and the new earth, those will flower into perfection. But you begin in this life. Not to perfection, but you begin it here. And you have a love for it. And that's why the new heaven and the new earth will be so beautiful. Because the thing you long to see just flourish here will do so in the new heaven and the new earth. Paul says it's a saying that's trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. It's likely that this was some kind of saying that was there in the church. That godliness is of value in every way as it holds promise for this present life and the life to come. It's a saying that we can have among ourselves as well. That godliness is of value in every way. You You might be living in sin right now, resisting the work of the Spirit feeling like you can't break from a certain sin. You might be here sort of stagnating in your faith and saying, I just, I just can't grow in this way. It's too hard. That's one of my favorite illustrations from a, from a speech I heard a number of years ago. The, the speaker was talking about telling his son to rake leaves off the yard. And he came back later in the day and not a single leaf had been raked. And he talked to his son and said, like, what's going on? And the kid was like, it's just too hard. And he said, you haven't even started. This idea that it's so hard that you can't do it. Pray for strength and energy and begin by the power of the Spirit, by the equipping of the Spirit, May that be something that God does, perhaps through this message right now, that where you have felt like, I cannot do this, I am unable to sit and spend time reading God's Word. I am unable to pray and schedule times of prayer. I'm unable to be part of a Bible study. I'm unable to be part of a small group because I just don't have the time and I just don't really enjoy it. I don't have time for, my, my family's so busy, we don't do family devotions. I don't really like to think about confessing my sins before God. There are sins that I've just got out there and I'm not going to confront them. But perhaps develop a practice of confession and repentance. Of Christian fellowship of discipleship and discipline, personal study. These are all things that you can do not to make you a better Christian, not to make God love you more, not so that you might be saved, but because you are saved, because you do belong to Jesus Christ. And because you want to enjoy His love. That is somebody who belongs to Jesus Christ, who is loved by God, and who has been saved by grace. These are things that you can do and feel His smile. Train yourself for godliness. Ask for areas where you'd love to grow. And pray that God might put people in your place who would be accountability partners, who would walk alongside you. Be that pastors or elders or friends that you would long to grow and see God work in you. And then finally, Paul says, this is about the mission of God. And so you got just really two things going on here. You got 
Paul toiling and, and striving, and then you've got Paul talking about doing so in hope. You know, Paul says, you know, the saying is trustworthy and true. He's talking about godliness. And then he, he says, for to this end we toil and strive. So the sense of toiling and striving is working, toiling. It's working to the point of weariness. And striving has a sense of contending with somebody. So they're involved with this struggle in this difficult work that just wears them down and, and takes so much out of them. But it is to this end, to the hope of godliness in themselves, but also in those learning the gospel of Jesus Christ. They struggle and they toil because they want, they want to see the promise of life for their hearers. That the gospel message, the message of being transformed by Jesus Christ is so important that they want everybody to hear it. And then he says that their hope, because we have set, we have our hope set on the living God. So in other words, they can do this hard work, they can toil and sweat and just be worn down and just beaten up by the struggle, but they can smile at the end of the day because they have set their hope on the living God. What Paul says to, to the Philippian church, Philippians 1 verse 6, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion on the day of Christ Jesus. That Timothy and Paul and pastors and even family members, brothers, sisters in Christ, parents, whatever. You can do this work of sharing the gospel, of training in godliness, because the one who began the good work in you will carry it on to completion. Your hope is set on the living God, not on yourself, but on Him. And then he concludes by saying, the living God who is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe. Now, there's a lot that can be said about this passage, and I'm not going to get into it all. Save to say this, it's not about what's called universalism, the idea that God has saved everybody. That's what some will say. This passage is God is the Savior of all people, so that means He saved everybody. Or it means that God wants to save everybody, but can't unless they believe. That's not what's being said either. The sense of what Paul is saying here is that God is the Savior of all kinds of people. That's important to get your mind around. For the early church, a major challenge for them was how... the the relationship between God and people could extend to those outside of Israel. That was a major issue. The book of Acts deals with it. The ministry of Paul is caught up with it. All of these early Christians who came from Judaism, where well, Christianity was a continuation of Judaism, were, were saying, no, 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 no. You need to be Jews to be saved, and you need to become part of Israel to be saved. No, God is Savior of all kinds of people. And there's also this sense in which Paul says, he's not saying that Jesus is Savior, he's saying God is Savior. And there is this sense in which you can say that God is Savior of all people in a different sense. Paul typically doesn't use this language. But you see it in the Old Testament. For instance, all of Israel was brought out of, was saved from Egypt. But not all went into Canaan. Right? That there is the sense in which the sun rises on the good and the evil. There is this sense in God's providential care that He cares for the whole world. There is this sense, you know, Paul says that in his talk at, in Athens, you know, that we live, you know, He created all people. He holds the world in His hands. In Him we live and have our being. There is this relationship between God and the world where God is Lord but He is Savior, the one who saves us from our sins and saves us to new life in Jesus, especially to those who believe. Specifically, that the word can be translated that way, specifically those who believe. This is about the mission of God. This is about 
This is about God wanting the world to know the good news of Him, of His love, of what He's done in Jesus Christ. That we are to go out into the world and spread the good news, the Great Commission. And that as we do that, we toil and we struggle to bring the Word of God to all the nations. And that we do so in hope. We do so in hope because we know He is the Lord of history. And that He is working through us, that we get to participate in His work. Timothy is a pastor, but we as the people of God. That we get to participate in what God's doing in the world to let people know about Jesus. And so may the pastor do so faithfully as a good servant, but may we also be the church of Christ in this place, participating in God's work by His grace and to His glory. Amen.